following program on Ave Verna 24 is classified for general audience. It is intended for all ages. It contains little or no violence, no strong language, and little or no sexual dialogue or situations. Tonight, we discuss the legislature surrounding corruption and bribery. With the new key anti-corruption bill making waves in the legal and political spheres, what measures ensure the prevention of malicious acts such as bribery? How are these offences deemed present realistically? And how does the law evolve to combat corruption effectively? Very good evening to everyone joining us tonight on Law Land at Liberty, where we bring to you essential information on key legal issues that are pertinent in Sri Lanka. Now, if you have been keeping up with current events lately, I'm sure one key event that may have caught your eye would be the introduction of the new anti-corruption bill. Now, while there's a lot to be interpreted with the key legislature such as this, it's important that we lay a solid foundation on the very basics of these laws. Now, what exactly are the fundamentals of issues such as corruption and bribery. And for that, joining me tonight is a figure that has contributed a significant amount of information to this field, and that is President's Counsel Sarah Jayamana. Thank you very much, sir, for taking the time to speak to us and our viewers uh, this fine evening. Uh, thank you very much, sir. Mr. Jayaman is also the former Director General of the Investigation of Bribery and Corruption Commission of Sri Lanka. So I'm pretty sure we can get a very educational intake on this discussion and we can have a very insightful discussion as well. Well, before we begin, here is a breakdown of tonight's discussion so our viewers have a clear outlook on how the discussion is going to go. First, we'll be focusing on the laws surrounding bribery. Next, we'll delve into corruption laws and its prosecution. And finally, we'll be talking on the newly introduced anti-corruption bill as well as potential reforms. All right, sir. Well, once again, thank you very much for taking the time, sir. So without further ado, let's get right into the discussion. And I'm pretty sure a lot of us watching tonight will have some idea of what bribery and corruption entails. But there's a lot of noise in the public forum when it comes to bribery and corruption, mainly allegations. Uh, not much uh, educational insight that's being cycled uh, through the general public. So I'm pretty sure for us to get uh, a good idea on what exactly these concepts are, we should uh, go right to the legislature, sir. So, if you could, could you please uh, point out to us where exactly the legislature lies when it comes to bribery? Uh, the legislature with regard to bribery lies with the Bribery Act that was introduced in the year 1954. In addition to that, in 1994, there was another piece of legislation that is commissioned to investigate into allegations of bribery and corruption. In addition to uh, 1985, uh, the Asset Declaration Law. Before going into the technicalities of this subject, it is very prudent to discuss why people are worried. Because uh, they are naturally uh, perfect in thinking our situation is very bad. Yes, I do agree, our situation is very bad. Why they decide like that? They see what is happening in our country and in the meantime, they are making a comparison with other countries whose bribery and corruption situation was worse than Sri Lanka. And now, within maybe one or two decades or three decades, they have come up in the ladder in the anti-corruption regime. So that is where we can learn a lot. For example, very common example that is cited is the Singapore experience. No? In 1956, the young Lee Kuan Yew, who just passed off from Oxford, Cambridge University, he visited Sri Lanka. Then he was mesmerized with the resources we have, the natural beauty, the sea, water resource, what is they are underneath the soil, the animals, elephants, jungles, gems, what not. So this is an island blessed with so much resources. Uh, compared to that, 
what was singapore it was basically a country with slums they never had any resources they never even had the water they imported water from malaysia and other countries after coming here he wanted to see his country would be one day developed like sri lanka then he got the support of one of his friends who was a graduate from oxford in law and thereafter they gave an undertaking to the people in singapore undertaking is yes we don't have any resources any natural resources in this country but we will make a determination that one day sri lanka like sri lanka the singapore also would be made a developed country and he gave a direct indication where he is going my only resource that i am blessed with the integrity of all singaporeans including the public servants so public servants were selected on meritocracy they have to perform if they don't perform they are fired and if you are really performing well they are paid high salary and allowances uh, quite a number of perks so that is how that country even from the younger days their children are very disciplined and that is how singapore has been brought to that level in the world rankings that is prepared by the un singapore today in number 3 how a country with so much corruption within few decades has gone to that level then what happened take a country like hong kong they were also like singapore but few decades later they also learned a lot from singapore See, uh, hong kong was under british rule and who was the richest person in hong kong a britisher a police commissioner and how did he become such a rich person and it was unofficially accepted every police officer they used to take a bribe and even they affix a sticker once a bribe is taken from a vehicle so that is how ultimately the police commissioner a britisher became the most richest person then what happened people in in hong kong they made a big issue they took to their streets and demanded this police officer be prosecuted by that time he had fled from hong kong but the british authorities brought him back to hong kong and did the prosecution he was sentenced to jail from there from that day onwards all the corruption related investigations were handled not by the police they established the anti corruption commission in hong kong that is how those countries uh, from the highest level there was a political will to introduce new no, these laws now in a nutshell to respond to your question what is bribery bribery means as it stands today in sri lankan context if you are a public servant if you demand from a member of the general public any kind of a gratification to perform that particular function or refrain in for performing a particular function and that is called bribery sometimes the purpose may not be clear even in that instance if you ask any kind of a gratification from a member of a general public that is self an offense what are the types of gratification the commonest type of gratification is the money money can be gratification uh, we can the stay in a hotel a foreign tour uh, any, any other commission giving a car whatever the facility that is gratification and what about the sexual sexual gratification it was not in the law the obtaining given sexual pleasure 
to the, the public servant is a gratification. It was not defined in law, but in our courts, in certain cases, they have interpreted in such a way. But in the new law, sexual gratification has been recognized as an offence. So bribery is that because in our country, uh, the most procedures are not clear. For, for example, if you want to take a permit, a, me a member of the general public has to go from one place to another place. So ultimately what will happen? A person coming from far away, uh, Ulhichia, to get a work done in Colombo, they will wait till 2.30 by 3.30. They don't see the public servant is there. The body language of the public servant mm. is very negative. Then what happened? At the particular person quietly approaches this Kamiya who has come from far away and say, why are you wasting time? You have to come on another day. I have a friend of mine who knows this particular public official. Uh, we'll pay something and get it done. Otherwise, you don't have a place to stay in Colombo tonight. Naturally, that person will fall prey. So that is how it happens in most of the government institutions. That is how it is plagued with bribery. Main reason for the bribery is these persons who want to get a service done with the public servants, you have to go and meet them eye to eye. When you meet eye to eye, only there's a possibility of asking a bribe. In other countries, they hardly meet public servants eye to eye. You have to always make your applications online. When you make applications online, 95%, 96% services can be done. Only in a rare occasions that they are required to meet a public servant, even if they meet, they are under close scrutiny of CCTV cameras. In our country, how many heads of government department are prepared to introduce this online system? How many heads of government departments, with how they are prepared to introduce this CCTV camera system? If your integrity is clean, very good. You don't need CCTV cameras. A country like Singapore or Japan, sometimes their shops are open. And we see, even when you go to far down, down south, going to Katargama, you can see there are some vegetable and fruits by the side of the road. We see number of fruits and other things, but there is no one to be seen there. But still, we never touch those things. We toot our horn, the owner or the lady, a young daughter will come far away and they will provide the fruit to us. So that is the integrity that we have developed in a country like Japan. From their younger days, they are taught not to steal someone's property. So sir, does that mean there is a systematic issue when it comes to the societal role, uh, the, the role that society plays when it comes to enabling things like bribery? Yeah, or definitely. Is it because the system itself is dissuading general public yes. in order to enable uh, Definitely. Bribery. There are a couple of things to This problem cannot be isolated, cannot be handled through merely introducing stringent laws. That is very clear, no? Now, we have for, yes, stringent laws are necessary. In the meantime, from the younger days, the integrity, concept of integrity and the discipline has to be introduced. And even, even from the younger days, these children in Japan, they walk on the queue. They never jump the queue. And they, when they cross the road, all the motorists stop the bus. And only one parent will be there to facilitate the crossing of these children. And all the children go to their nearby schools. So how, how cultured they are. And these children are taught from the younger days how to clean up their washrooms and other things. So therefore, this culture of respect to others is very important. And you see now, do we see these things? Even through the media, we don't see uh, even a video clip that, that uh, shows that encourages the culture of respect and the integrity. So therefore what I say is, we have to think 
enhancing the values of the people. In addition to that, we have to think how prevention steps can be taken in the government institute. Then thirdly only, we have to think the only method the people of this country know to punish the perpetrator. But we have to understand, in the eyes of law, everyone is presumed to be innocent. That is the cornerstone of Article 13 of the Constitution. However much people shout, however much some politicians come before the most famous wall in the country, bribery commissioners for, and give a TV interviews, recordings, video clips, and media channels also give prior to those things. But underneath those files, there may not be any evidence that is admissible in a court of law. That would contain only hearsay material. That is exactly where I would like to direct your attention next to, sir, when it comes to hearsay material and evidence collection and also the introduction of an investigation into bribery or suspicions of bribery. How does that go about in Sri Lankan law, sir? Because, because if a public servant asks a bribe from me, what you should you do? You must either call the bribery commission hotline is 1954. That is the year the bribery act was introduced, right? Then you must go and make a statement to the bribery commission. In the statement, you can say, these are the circumstances, these are the documents, and this uh, public servant asks a bribe from me. I have already given part, but he's demanding the balance part be given. So then the bribery commission will look at this complaint and if they feel this is there is some merit in what they say, then bribery commission will tell, if he demands again, we will send one of our persons to accompany you. He is called a decoy. He will cover the conversation between the complainant and the suspect. We will prepare Tribal Commission will prepare marked notes. They will note down the markings of the notes. And during the discussion, when the complainant gives the money, either directly or with the help of the decoy, once the money is given, another team who is overlooking this entire transaction, they will approach and once the bribe is taken, he will be arrested. It is easy to say, but my question is, is there's a famous question that is asked, no? Uh, those high-powered business community, they must come and complain. How many business leading entrepreneurs, they come to the bribery commission and complain? Hardly any. Hardly any. But see the other way, uh, an Indian national, he had the courage, not only the courage, he was fond of the Sri Lanka. When he was demanded maybe several millions of bribe, he was not bothered the, the status of that public servant. That public servant was none other than chief of staff of the president. He along with another uh, chairman of a government corporation, they have been demanding this bribe from this businessman. He was living in Sri Lanka, but he was an Indian national. What did he do? He recorded all this solicitation and kept it with him for a couple of months. Thereafter, he came to the bribery commission. So bribery commission was convinced. They didn't go and arrest straight away. They waited for nearly three months. Now you are going, if successful, going to arrest the chief of staff of the president. And the integrity of the investigation should be at the highest level. Of course, they kept this secret. And on one particular day, when the accused said, we'll do the business tomorrow, deal that tomorrow, but they did not tell where the location is. They, they were changing their locations. Suddenly they said, okay, come to a five-star hotel 
in front of Goldface. So they went to the Goldface Hotel, complained the two accused. Thereafter, they had a soft drink. They took some empty bags from the hotel, went to the car park. In the car park, this complainant was there. He was ready with money in his car. He was accompanied by one of our officers. He was the decoy. He was trained to be an Indian person. So he spoke even in Hindi with this, this complainant to convince. So thereafter, the complainant gave this bribe to this first accused. While he was counting the bribe, bribe 20 million, other accused was standing nearby. Then the officials went there and arrested. How much planning you have to do? How much planning you have to do? So therefore, what is most important is the people in this country, especially the business community, rather than blaming the system, they must courageously come forward. They need to take the initiative when it the, comes to, yes. they need to lead by example, example. when it comes to the, uh, uh, the investigation of bribery and the complaint. Initial complaint has to go by someone that has experienced this uh, issue yes. as well. It's not like uh, the bribery commission or the investigation uh, authority yes. has uh, eyes and ears uh, everywhere. Yes. But we need to hold ourselves accountable to issues such as bribery and uh, we need to really uh, take uh, uh, lead by example, yes, basically. Yes. So there's a, a lot for us to discuss when it comes to the rest of this topic. Uh, but before that, uh, let's take a very short commercial break. You're watching Law, Land and Liberty. Stay with us. Welcome back to Law, Land and Liberty. We were in conversation with President's Counsel Sarah Jayaman and we were talking about bribery and its fundamentals and how we as a people uh, have a responsibility when it comes to the investigation of bribery and uh, when it comes to really the initial domino, pushing of the domino block that leads to uh, uh, the measures done by law enforcement when it comes to uh, the investigation of bribery, sir. Now that we know a lot about the fundamentals of bribery, bribery and basically what consists of bribery and how uh, we can uh, combat these issues, we should probably go into the most pertinent topic uh, that is corruption. Now sir, a lot of us will, uh, you know, when we see certain cases related to bribery and corruption on screen when it comes to major key figures in the Sri Lankan political atmosphere or even business atmosphere, uh, we'll see the word corruption and we will assume it is a very negative thing, but I'm pretty sure a lot of us are not aware exactly what corruption is. So could you uh, please, just like how you explain to us uh, how, uh, uh, the, how uh, bribery uh, is broken down, could you please let us know about corruption as well, sir? What are the fundamentals? Yes, because in most occasions, you are unable uh, to catch the bribe taker. Then what do you do? You look at the decisions he takes. Most of the public servants are vested with wide discretion. When using the discretion, only this corruption would come into the picture. In a nutshell, what is corruption? In a nutshell, corruption is, if you are a public servant, you take your office, official position for private gain. The gain need not be for the benefit of the public servant. You take a decision, knowing very well, uh, there will be an advantage to a third party. You take a decision, knowing very well, that there will be a loss to another party. Similarly, you take a decision, knowing very well, that you will also be benefited. So therefore, this is a decision-making process. And you have to done in a dishonest manner. Merely make a wrong decision would not attract criminal liability. 
but you have to prosecution has to establish that you have taken this decision with an ulterior motive. Then how do we prove that? Take for example a procurement that the public servant sitting in a public procurement committee. What does he do? There are so many bids that have come up. Then what, what does he do? You have to have a technical evaluation committee. Because sometimes there may be the bidders who give the, the quotation, the lowest bid. If you merely go by the lowest bid, what will happen? The quality may not be up to the mark. So that is why there has to be a technical evaluation committee who has to examine all these bits and say, technically, the bidder number one product is sound, number two, then, uh, then comes. Likewise, they have to make a recommendation. Then the, the committee has to take a decision. And if it is found that the tender has been offered to a party, that is not really suitable their cost of the product also very high and definitely thereby there is huge amount of money the government is going to lose. So this is why where the corruption is. Again, it is much easier to say. But when you start conducting investigation, the issue is there should be public regulations, financial regulations, other monetary regulation which gives a clear-cut identification with whom this particular decision has been vested with. The difficulty in the investigation is most of our rules and regulations are loosely worded. You can't pinpoint at a one particular person. When we prosecute against a person, he will come out with another document and say, it is not I who should take a decision. For example, in a hypothetical case, we'll, we'll assume that uh, a, a case is filed against a politician for giving a job, we'll assume. But in the eyes of law, the politician has no role to play in giving a job. Who has to give the job then? It is the secretary of the ministry or the head of the particular organization. It, it is that particular person who gives this particular job to an unwanted person. So if you are prosecuting the politician, he would say, I have nothing to do with this. So therefore, our public servants should be straightforward. You know, there's a famous case called Sil Reddy case, right? The, the uh, secretary uh, was indicted. We do not know, we, he may have not got even a one cent of that entire transaction. He may have carried out orders of another person, but that is not an excuse. Because in the eyes of law, he is responsible. So therefore, in eradicating corruption in this country, it is the, the role played by the senior public servants. They should not give in to the whims and fancies of the politicians. So then, in proving the corruption cases, we need to lay down clear-cut rules and regulation. That is number two, that is called corruption. Then, there is another offence, because generally Sri Lankans, they want to show off, not merely taking bribe, thereafter they want to put up a big house, buy a land, have a fancy car, when you look at those things, you get the idea how being a public servant, his salary is this amount. From his parents, he may have got this amount. But see the way he is having a luxurious life. So his expenses cannot be compatible with his non-income. Then there's a presumption in law. If there's a deficit, between his expenses and his known income, that deficit has been acquired through bribery. That is called asset declaration. That is called uh, accumulation of asset through unlawful means. So those are the three offenses.
Okay, so well, I mean, there is a lot for us to discuss when it comes to corruption as well, but I feel like that introduction uh, that uh, you gave us really uh, dwelled into the uh, very key issues when it comes to the offense of corruption and uh, where we as a people can also uh, help and contribute uh, to the investigation of these uh, offenses as well. But uh, we should probably now move on to uh, a very pertinent area that is the new uh, bill that has been brought about. But uh, before that, let's take a very short commercial break. You're watching Law, Land and Liberty. Stay with us. Welcome back to Law, Land and Liberty. We were in discussion with President's Counsel Sarat Jayamana and we were talking about bribery and corruption and the fundamentals of bribery and corruption and how it is directly linked to every one of the members of society in Sri Lanka and how we all have a part to play when it comes to uh, the prevention of such crimes. Now, sir, I think is the most uh, awaited uh, area of this entire discussion for our viewers and that is a discussion on the new anti-corruption bill. Sir, could you please uh, have, of course, we are very well aware that uh, uh, you are a very key figure when it comes to uh, the uh, talk around the bill as well and of course the contents in the bill also, sir. So I feel you would be the best person uh, to actually break down for our viewers how the the fundamentals of the anti-corruption bill that is being uh, tabled right now. Mm, thank you very much. It is a very pertinent question. That is not a question only for Sri Lanka. The world community understood if corruption prevails in a particular country, the, it is closely linked to the economy of this country. The people of that country will suffer. So then what happened? The world community got together and in the year 2004, they passed a convention. They ratified a convention that is called United Nations Convention Against Corruption. Sri Lanka straight away went there and uh, placed our signature. Then the moment you place your signature, they expect us to introduce certain new aspects. And not only that, UNODC, United Nations Office Against Drugs and Crimes, they supervise whether we are aligning with the convention obligations. So likewise, there were several review cycles. During these review cycles, they have realized there are so many loopholes in our system. And they have categorized according to world rankings where Sri Lanka were. And Sri Lanka were, they were 89 in the year 2019. Now we have gone down to rankings 102. In the Asian region, uh, Singapore number 3, Hong Kong number 13, and Bhutan number 25. Those are the three countries in the world rankings who are in the up in the ladder. How they have achieved those things? Because they say there are key elements that you need to have. Now in our country, the commission was entrusted, we say it is an independent commission, but in true sense it is not independent. Why I say it is not independent? I will give one example. No sooner I came as the DG of the Bribery Commission, I wrote to this number 13 ranking country, the chairperson, I asked, could you please uh, train our officers, the investigators, to conduct investigation? He immediately wrote back to me and say, we have an issue with you. How can you say your investigators are independent? They belong to the police department. At any moment, they can be transferred out. An action can be taken against them by the police department. How can you say that they are truly independent? For which we never had answers. And we never had the graduates as investigators. If you, then he invited me to come to Hong Kong. When I went to Hong Kong, I realized in those countries, investigators are not done by the ordinary police officers. It is the professionals, the engineers, accountants, auditors, who has this forensic accounting background. They are, they are very intelligent, they are very sharp, 
they know how to conduct investigations quickly. That is why we need to recruit a talented, exclusive investigators. But how as at present, these investigators we have to borrow from the police department. Not only that, we have to go through the public service administration setup. That is the debacle. So even if you want to run the commission properly, we don't have enough funds. So therefore, under the UN Convention, they have made a Kalambu commentary on Jakarta Declaration. They discuss about the most important thing, the independence, means monetary independence. And they have the power to recruit human resources. So in the new act, we don't need to go and kneel down before the treasury and other government bodies. Why? The bribery commission is conducting investigation against the treasury officials as well. So no one wants to strengthen the bribery commission. So now here in after, bribery commission will have to make an estimate and get funds directly from the parliament approval. That is how all these successful countries do, number one. Number two, they have been vested with the power to recruit whoever they want whoever they want. So therefore, they can recruit the best in the trade. They are sought after investigators. They can interview them, select them. And not only that, if they are not performing well, they should be asked to leave. That is how even in Singapore, Hong Kong, Malaysia, Bhutan, they are always being monitored. But in our country, public servants, when they join, right throughout their public servants, unless they, they get caught to some offence, right? they, even they, you work or not, you remain there. So you, there's no assessment, appraisal of their performance. Bribery commission cannot be run in such a fashion. So therefore, hereinafter, after, bribery commission will get quality investigators. Not only that, they will get the quality prosecutors also. We have to accept no, that I was a senior additional source general in the AGS department. Right? It is the younger crowd who are attracted to the Attorney General's department. Why? They have a future prospects in going to the judiciary and becoming a great lawyer. So no one would come and join the bribery commission. That's a huge challenge. If we want to attract young public uh, prosecutors, we have to give them a good salary. In a country like Fiji, the salary of a prosecutor is higher, very much higher than the salary of even a prosecutor in the attendance department. So therefore, except you officers in the bribery commission, uh, we find it diff very difficult to find very sharp prosecutors. People want to bribery and uh, corruption to be prosecuted, but ultimately what happened? They always go and ask, when it comes to major cases, the assistance of the attendance department. Now they take the view, we were doing this prosecution earlier, before 1994. You wanted to make your commission independent. Why are you coming back to us? So then the quality of the prosecution should be enhanced. And we have to make a system change. No one would like system change. The present investigators may not like this change. Even the present legal officers, most of them, they might not like this change. I would like to interject there, sir. What exactly, you know, in your opinion, what does that entail for the current officers that are uh, connected to the uh, commission? Now, actually, there's... they have to really work hard. No, not only they have to work hard, they have to be properly supervised. If they don't perform, it is up to the commission to take a decision, because we can't write, run a commission without having a good prosecutors. And if they are really doing well, they should be compensated with additional amount of money. Because we don't want, the country does not want to have a bribery commission who does not have the very strong, sharp prosecutors. I don't know. Most of the legal officers, they like this change. Because normally they like, uh, no one should be there to supervise us. So therefore, when that is what happened when you want to make a change, most of them try to protest these things. Entire country might want a change, but some legal officers in the private commission, they might not like this change. Why? They'll be exposed. If they are not good, they'll be asked by the commission to show your uh, talents. Then we are going to introduce new offences, like conflict of interest. Because conflict of interest is the root cause for the bribery. 
What do you mean by conflict of interest? For example, if, if I am a public servant, if I am supposed to take a decision uh, with regard to a particular party, particular individual, if I have connection with that particular person, relationship, schoolmate, classmate, other relationship, I have to divulge to my senior. And today I may not have the relationship, but I know in a couple of months, one of his relatives is going to get married to my, my relatives. So then I have to divulge. Number three, I don't have any connection, but I know people in the area think I have a connection with them. I have to divulge that conflict. If I don't divulge, what will happen? It has been made a criminal offense in this country. So therefore we have included a conflict of interest as a criminal offense in this country. That is one of the important aspects. Then a bribery commission did not have the power to conduct investigations into money laundering. Those, that offense was also introduced. Then the sports corruption introduced. Then the private sector bribery. One might ask question, what is the concern of the government in the private sector if they are giving bribe to each other? Just imagine if there is a supermarket chain, the suppliers manager of the supermarket gives a bribe to the another person who provided the supplies. So as a result of giving a bribe, what will happen? You have to increase the cost of the, that particular product. When you increase the cost of the product, what will happen? The poor, the people will have to pay a higher amount. Quality might go down, cost of living will go up, and this private sector, they enjoy the natural, natural luxuries, resources of this country. So therefore, this bribery act, we have introduced private sector bribery as well. Then, we have, they have been invested with new investigation techniques, special techniques. For example, electronic evidence can be used. They can follow uh, wiretapping, bugging. So there are so many other methods of uh, investigation. Those methods are followed by other countries. Without having the facility of those methods, we may not be able to run a very effective bribery commission. Then we have introduced certain provisions that will protect the informers, that will protect the whistleblowers. Who are the whistleblowers? In a government organization, right? There may be a person who knows a lot of information. He can divulge this information to the head of the organization. And if you divulge this information to the head of the organization, what will happen? One day, uh, the, he, the action can be taken against him. So therefore, under these uh, laws, the, we have protected. We have protected the whistleblowers and we have introduced new laws also. Then if you come and lodge a false complaint, Sometimes that happens. If you come and lodge a false complaint, and if it is proved that's a false complaint, action can be taken against that particular person. So likewise, we have introduced a number of options in this present law, right, with regard to the bribery and corruption, the investigators and the prosecution. Then we, 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 then <clears throat> we come to a very important area that is called asset declaration. Why asset declaration is needed? Because Whenever you conduct investigations into assets, the first document, the investigator would look at the asset declaration submitted by the senior public servants. Up to now, all these educated, highly qualified public servants, they prepare their annual asset declaration manually. It is a shame. And there are certain loopholes in the existing laws. So therefore what we have done, we have introduced an electronic asset declaration system. And there will be only one place that you send this asset declaration. That is, a, there will be a separate directorate in the bribery commission. You send all the asset declaration. Then you can, you will automatically get an acknowledgement. Next year, what is expected from you? You have to edit and update the last year's asset declaration. If you don't give the asset declaration, what will happen? Then if you fail to give asset declaration on the due date, due date is uh, 30th of June. For one month, there won't be any prosecution, but there will be a surcharge that is equivalent to one month's salary. For the second month also, if they don't give the asset declaration, what will happen? Again, they are not prosecuted. Then there will be a surcharge equivalent to the six times the salary. 
and if you don't give the asset declaration for the third time only, that they will be prosecuted. So we have introduced such methods in the asset declaration form and uh, the bribery commission has been vested with the powers to have a links with other government institution, more traffic department, ministry of land, and thereby through online system, they can check whether this pub particular public servant has acquired more assets. So thereby they can verify the truth or otherwise of the asset declaration submitted by the public servants. And there were certain category of people, they were not required to give asset declaration. The president, the prime minister, the provincial council members, then the, the, the diplomats, uh, the, there are so many categories of people, they were not required to give asset declaration. In addition to that, uh, you know, in certain government departments, certain, portion, certain persons are not holding high office. They are, they are middle rankers. They are not supposed to give asset declaration. But we know how, how vulnerable they are. If they are vulnerable, by way of a regulation, we can say these persons also should give the asset declaration. So likewise, we have widened the asset declaration. In the new act, there is a new dimension also. The commission has been vested with powers for prevention. They can ask the government departments to come out with anti-corruption plan come out with the prevention mechanism to strengthen your existing procedures and processes and commission can demand those should be done. So that is a very important aspect. Then they can conduct education programs. They can get the public support as well. Uh, so those things have been included. With regard to the asset declaration, the general public will be entitled to get, a, get an edited version, edited version of the asset declaration of the public servants. Why I say edited version? We have to protect the privacy of the public servant also. Subject to that, they will be given an edited version through electronic system. So then uh, prevention is there. They will look into various aspects. And uh, most importantly, the, the values of the children should be enhanced. You know, during our regime, uh, as required by the UNCAC, we have prepared this national action plan, national action plan, five-year national action plan. And this should be implemented, not only introducing this law, because even IMF, you know, is a, under them, under there's a requirement that new laws should be introduced. That is why this law is being introduced very soon. Uh, it is now before the parliament. I hope that will be debated after going through the various legal processes. Uh, so those are the key fe features. If you have any other questions, I'm prepared to. Let's Only go. one final question, so a very short answer question, I feel like. Does this mean that the corruption levels and the amount of injustices faced by the general public through the public uh, system, through our system, will eventually we'll be able to have hopes of countries such as Singapore and Hong Kong? It is up to the political will. People of this country also must take a responsibility. The country's leadership must take the responsibility. Right? Then only we will be successful. Merely introducing laws won't do. We need to find a mechanism how these laws are implemented. Even the National Action Plan that was launched on, on a cabinet approval 18th of March 2019, we don't see yet it has been implemented. We don't want to see the same plight be fallen on the new act. So they, therefore it is up to the authorities. Not only introduce new act, but see that this act are implemented. For that, you need to have a mechanism because we are making a huge system change and that requires every government department should have an officer called integrity officer. We have prepared handbooks for integrity officers, his role. So like that is from the prevention side. So likewise, it is a concerted effort. So we will invite those, uh, those who have the expertise, the experience and will uh, the feeling for the country and who are practical. And sometimes I feel some people are talking bribery and corruption, but they sometimes lack the basic understanding of the law. We can't put everyone behind the law. There has to be a fair investigation. There has to be a fair trial for the accused. So therefore my fervent hope that once the law is passed, there has to be a strong political will for all segments, including the leaders of this country, to properly implement this piece of law. 
we all have a role to play when it comes to the uh, upholding of the integrity yes. of uh, Sri Lankans uh, nationwide. We, we have to have our own integrity, we have to lead by example and the new act is extremely promising as well. Uh, unfortunately, uh, our time uh, here today uh, concludes now. Uh, time has come against us in this very interesting discussion. Thank you very much, sir, for taking the time to break down for our viewers what the new act entails and the fundamentals of bribery and corruption. So I'm sure a lot of us uh, will uh, leave uh, today uh, with a lot more information and a lot more insight. So before they uh, uh, open their mouths to uh, say certain things that have been uh, circulated uh, frequently around social circles, we'll now stop and think and uh, there will be a self uh, assessed responsibility when it comes to uh, this issue. Thank Th you very thank much. Thank you very much for giving this opportunity. In fact, we prepared this first draft in, two, in the year 2019. Thereafter, it was not seriously taken. Now, the present Minister of Justice, he has appointed a committee to finalize the draft which we already prepared. And in that committee, I was the chairman. Then we got the support of the other experts. We gave our opportunities for other stakeholders also. Then only, the finally, the act now before the parliament has been drafted with the support of other experts and the legal draftsmen. And there were, there were various other stakeholders. We, we took their views seriously and incorporated as much as possible because we have to strike a balance. We can't be partisan in introducing these laws. And thank you very much for giving this valuable opportunity share my thoughts with the viewers uh, of uh, Derana today. Thank you so much. All right. Well, corruption and bribery are not new threats to any citizen of any nation across the globe. Despite the grim signs of such injustices being ever present around us, it is essential that we as a country do not grow desensitized to any of its forms and continue to fight corruption with the already available legislative means. We leave you tonight with the words of Chinese President Xi Jinping. We must uphold the fighting of tigers and flies at the same time, resolutely investigating law-breaking cases of leading officials and also earnestly resolving the unhealthy tendencies and corruption problems which happen all around people. That is all from us here at Law, Land and Liberty. If you missed today's program, you can always rewatch by catching us on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. I'm Anradi Vikram Singha. Have a great night.